Hi everyone, I'm Jace Haskell and welcome to What A Flanker, the podcast. Now my guest today is an English former professional rugby union player who played for a number of sides in England and Wales, including Bath and London Wasps. He represented England and captained both our under-16s and under-18 teams before his career was cut short through a life-changing spinal injury. Of course, it is the one and only Ed Jackson. That's the most formal thing you've ever said to me before <laughs> that intro. How formal is that? Yeah, so, so formal. Professional. Well, we can put that intro away now. <laughs> we won't throw away your book because we're actually here to talk about Lucky, your new book, which is actually out today. Yeah. Hence the beers. Cheers. And also, every time we get together, we're just a couple of mad lads. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. But, um, mate, thank you so much for coming to do this. Um, your story is phenomenal, um, emotional and amazing, and kind of all the the things that What A Flank is about. I've obviously been fascinated in what you, you've done in your recovery. Um, and, you know, I really wanted to sort of share with the listeners today kind of the, the trials and tribulations you, you've gone through. But I think best to start with, first of all, how are you? You're looking great. You're looking tanned, looking sexy. Thanks, mate. T- tan disguised everything, right? I'm yeah. actually sloppy rig as usual. Really? Well, yeah, not in the best nick. But I've been, did a challenge recently in Iceland. So I'm feeling fit. But the problem is it doesn't, you know, walking fitness doesn't necessarily put you in good shape, but I've got good, uh, good tan, which hides everything right. That's why no one's ever said, you know, I'd like a rig like Mo Farah or yeah. uh, like a speed walker. You're like, yeah, they're lean, but, yeah. you know, not really anything exactly. else. Talk to me about this thing in Iceland, because you are one mad bastard who's up to stuff. I can't keep up. I mean, I remember I had a conversation with you the other day, and I was like, oh, I'd like to do one of your challenges with you. And you're like, yeah, we're doing 79 men in one day. I was like, I won't be doing that. <laughs> That's definitely not the case, but... Iceland was actually one of the charity trips. So my charity, Millimeters Mountains, we take away beneficiaries and, and fundraisers. And we did six days camping, like off, completely off grid, which was amazing in itself. Um, mental country. Have you ever been? No. Got to go. Like okay. it's, it blew my, blew my socks off. Like I've been to Nepal. I've done all these, and, and it's on the same scale in terms of the, just everything supersized. The waterfalls make you feel like you're in a film. Like it's the massive isolation. Um, the mountains aren't that big, but it was just epic place to go. And two and a half hours from the plane from Heathrow, like it's so easy. Definitely be going back. But actually, we had an awesome trip. And then one of the girls on the trip lost her taste halfway around. We're like, mm, what? Well, she started not a liking your sign. fashion and stuff. Like yeah, that. yeah, <laughs> lost her taste. Yeah, start, yeah, very good. Um, You're welcome. But it turned out we were like, and then a few people got a bit sniffly, so we only got tested when we got back, and six of the group had COVID. <laughs> so it's like the most isolated country in fucking Europe, and you we still managed got to it. catch COVID. Then we got the we, we were like, okay, we'll just wait till we test negative because we we had it on the trip, got out the other side. Um, but it turns out the rules in Iceland are mandatory two week isolation with no parole. You can't test to release early. So I've been in Iceland for three weeks when I was only supposed to be there for like a week. Got back on Monday. I mean, and, and how was that? Did you confined to a hotel or? Well, they yeah, they, I mean, they were trying to get us in the COVID hotel prison and split us all up, but there were six of us in a group. So I managed to persuade them to let us stay together. So we rented a house outside Reykjavik and we were just in the house for, for well, we were, ended up being 10 days, not two weeks. But Did you know those people? I knew some of them. Right. Lois was in there with me. Um, Lois is your amazing partner who that, we want to sort of, we're going to talk to a bit about. But Yeah, yeah, she was there. Um, one of the beneficiaries was there. Ruri, who I hadn't met before the trip. My brother was in there, um, Freya and Alan. So yeah, I knew a couple of them before, but it was like that, that tense moment at the start. It's like, is everyone going to get on? Is this going to turn into a murder mystery? Yeah, that's like what I was about three. to say, because it's got all like Iceland, edgy. Yeah. You know, it's got like all the hallmarks of like someone's gone missing. murder with, mystery. Yeah, yeah. like an ice pick in the head in yeah. the coal cellar or something. Yeah. No, but it was, it was, it, it was great. Like, it wasn't great. It wasn't ideal, but it was. What um, did you do? Just played ball games and. Like, oh, honestly, James. mate, honestly. Well, actually, I was doing it. I had, because you could, I had my laptop, so I was still doing Zoom calls and, oh, and doing some work, actually. So it, was, it wasn't too bad. Although, I had to miss a couple of things, which was crap. I was supposed to be presenting the highlights of the li- second test of the Lions for Channel 4 because Lee was away, but I couldn't do that. Um, and I was going to miss the launch of my book today if I didn't get out early, which the irony of it being called Lucky, and I'm stuck in isolation in Reykjavik. But luckily, uh, luckily, I made it back. Uh, and you're all right now? Yeah, fine. Oh, I was fine the whole time. That was the most annoying thing because it was like we're being made to stay there, but we all felt absolutely normal. Did they check up on you at all? Were they like proper military? Hardly because there's only like, there's probably two doctors in the whole of Iceland. There's only like 14 people live there. So all of a sudden this COVID's hit 
And um, what's so Icelandic working... TV like as well? Did you try and watch any of it? Well, luckily they just watch American, uh, American, and we had Netflix and stuff. Actually, the house we had, we pretty lucked out. We had a sauna, hot tub, VR goggles. It sounds like a better thing than ever. <laughs> yeah, Why can we I gamed, get locked in? We gamed yeah. it pretty well. I mean, the thought of being in a hotel and in individual rooms for a week. But the thing was, we had a couple of vulnerable people on the trip with us. So, yeah. like, the nature of our beneficiaries is they're suffering with mental health issues because of trauma, whether that's physical or psychological. So when I spoke to doctors and expressed that and expressed my concern oh, over okay. splitting the group up, they were actually great. Like, they, they really helped Is that out. why I'm not allowed on any of these trips in case I push yeah, them over the edge? You, yeah, literally, physically and me <laughs> mentally, yeah. Well, look, I want to talk to you a bit about your your, your journey, obviously, um, from, from where you are. But I think we've got to start from the beginning. Like, you know, how come rugby? Uh, why, why did you get into it? Well, I, I wasn't actually a rugby player from a young age. It wasn't traditional route. I was swimming and tennis when I was like individual sports when I was a kid. But I was from Bath, right? So a big rugby town, yeah. Bath supporter. And actually, it got to the point where I was swimming competitively. And it was just like, it got too much. It was like head underwater, five o'clock in the morning before I school. I love I didn't know any of this like... as well. This is why I love this podcast. <laughs> I get people on that are like my mates. And I, my wife says, I never ask anyone any interesting questions less about myself. Yeah, because you're always <laughs> talking about yourself. You love <laughs> discovering Wait, all these things. That's enough about me. Let's talk about me. <laughs> um, right, okay. So the swimming's too much. So, I, yeah, I just wanted to do what my mates were doing because they were all playing, doing stuff together. And I was in, in like off on swimming galas all over the country. I was like, no, I don't want to do that anymore. So started playing rugby. Picked it up pretty quickly. Ended up getting a scholarship to Millfield. Um, yeah, and then England 16s, 18s, normal route. Signed for Bath for three years um, off the back of school, which was a dream for me because it was a childhood club. Um, got my debut at 18 against Leicester. It was all looking pretty sweet. Yeah. But then uh, this to get my shoulder. I think it was because I've always had issues with my shoulders and I think it's they're a bit over mobile from swimming. Yeah, I would have thought so. Yeah. And I've actually speaking to some other Guys, you know, Keenan Miles had a lot of shoulder issues, used to be a swimmer when he was younger. There's definitely a correlation there. So then I had a, uh, six months out recovering from a shoulder injury, and then I had the first game back, I did it again. So I had like nearly a year and a half out at 19 years old, you know, just as things were get, getting going. So then nearly retired after that, um, got released from Bath because I just wasn't recovering, and then gave it a second shot in Doncaster. Then Howes, the mental, mental Welsh coach, gave me a shout. Um, I thought I'd give it one more crack. Bit of a culture shock going from Bath to Donny. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. posh kid from Bath all of a sudden yeah. on Silver I Street. Watching... The only time I've ever seen Doncaster on a Channel 4 documentary. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. I think it was the AIDS capital of Europe for a while. Really? Yeah. yeah. Amazing. That badge. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. You've got to be the best at something, yeah. haven't you? <laughs> but um, you're gonna go, if you're going to go big, go real big. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it was like the first time it, I genuinely felt you're on a night out and it's not just the blokes who can beat you up, it's the women as well. Amazing. That is always but, very concerning. Yeah. But what was a daunting prospect at the start turned out to be the best move I could have made because I played every game that year in the championship and back then I mean it still is up front and forwards it's competitive like it's physical there's a lot more dirty stuff if goes on if you speak on. to the Saris, Saris boys who obviously have spent their time in there they have discovered it was like skull W like someone I think Someone ran up to punch. I mean, if you don't know anything about rugby, Saracens are a, a, a premiership team that got relegated because they were cheating bastards, allegedly. <laughs> um, and um, they went down. And obviously, the championship is, is is a league below. And one of the players, Jamie George, is now on the Lions store. Ran into contact. The guy just punched him in the face, like just basically just chinned him. Yeah. And everyone was like appealing to the referee. <laughs> the referee was like, "Play on, lads. There is yeah. no fourth official here. There is nothing. And whatever you know goes on, goes on." Yeah. No, and it was, and it, but that was good for at my age. You know, there's one of the younger people in a in a, in a in a pack and having to deal with that sort of stuff, and brought me on as a player quite a lot. And then I signed for London Welsh. She was sort of in the upper end of the championship, and then we ended up winning the championship that year, first time that when on what London Welsh had been in the Premiership. That was an amazing experience. Went to the Premiership. We'd actually won five games before Christmas. We were seventh in the league, beating Exeter. Last play of the game, lost to Sarries just because Luke Pearce. Fucked up the he, he, <laughs> he blew for full time on a on a on a free kick on a, for a scrum. Well, but, now re which, it's not. I, I you know I've forgotten about it and everything. I'm yeah, over, look, I'm over got it. I'm over it. Not yeah. bring it up again. No, no, no. You, no, no, do, you should it. do a video like Razzy Erasmus again. <laughs> if you don't know, Google Razzy Erasmus's video. Twenty six points of why referees are awful yeah. and why uh, South Africa should have won. So yeah, but glad you yeah. moved on. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've moved on. I'm over it. I'm over it. Yeah, I'm over it. Yeah, but. We then, like strength and depth told, they got relegated the next season. We got relegated the next season. I jumped ship to Wasps, which is where you were at the time. Yeah. Captain down there. I think we bonded pretty well on the 
uh, social thing, wasn't it? <laughs> we did. Yeah. Steaming in infernos at the bar, just drinking. I love you. No, I think I love you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But That's I how mean, it always I'm, starts. Oh uh, yeah, it's the best way. I mean, my yeah. kind of my. Uh, obviously, my first impressions of you were like unbelievable engine. You always had a mad engine, like um, you're, you know, you're obviously fitness and everything else. That was incredible. I don't know whether that came from the swimming or, or Maybe, you know, yeah. but you uh, but you also were the kind of perfect hybrid of a professional and a amateur. Work hard, play hard. <laughs> Work hard, play yeah, hard. Yeah. yeah, I swear. Was it? Was it? Was it either you or, or one of the other players who like had just been smashing a load of strawberry daiquiris the day before? Yeah, the or if, the fitness test. Yeah, Henley Regatta before. Yeah, yeah the day yeah. before, and you and then you run with the fear because you know if you don't win, someone's going to flag something up. Yeah, yeah, that was me. <laughs> I, I love that. I mean, just looking back at those those playing days for a minute and and how it it set you up because you basically left Wasp then and went to the Dragons, didn't you? Yeah, uh, and it was actually at the Dragons that you then um, injured yourself. Yeah. I mean, how many games did you actually play for the Dragons in the end? Um, so I'd, it was the end of my second season, oh, right. or halfway through my second season. So I played like 30, 40 games. And what, and what was that like, leaving Wasp? Because obviously I know you didn't necessarily, you left Wasp because you wanted to get more game time. Yeah, yeah. Again, a bit like the bar situation where you were talented, but you didn't really feel like you were getting yeah. the opportunities. Yeah, well, I, so Lynn Jones had been my coach at London Welsh and he texted me in my first, second year at Wasp. I think he'd seen, obviously, Nets Nathan had signed at the same time yeah, and yeah. He was, it wasn't bad. Um, and so, and he said, look, when Di speaks to you again about renegotiating contracts, give me a shout because I, I want to, yeah. you know. And he just said, look, why do you want to come and have a different experience, come and start every week, playing the Pro 14. And I was at that stage of my career where like England wasn't a, a likely anymore. So I was just like, yeah, new experience. Love yeah. Cardiff anyway. A couple of my best mates were, were Welsh from Cardiff. I've been going there since I was a kid. Um, and I went down there and we lost pretty much every weekend, but absolutely loved it. Really? Yeah, I loved it. And and also when I first went there, Toby was still playing, was playing eight, I was playing six or vice versa. And we had you know, some good players there. And also you're on the away trips all of a sudden. You know, yes. Every weekend you're in Dublin or Edinburgh or Italy and it's like a stag do every other weekend. I mean, that, and that's one of the things I was going to ask you, just from that mental state of kind of being, you know, a professional, sw well, but getting into swimming and then transferring over and having kind of those ups and downs like what would you say because I want to explore your mental state later on how were you with that was it like disappointment were you were you just playing because you love rugby in the end because I know because you're a very competitive animal like I never you know we I talk about um there's obviously an Instagram and social media called team bin juice you should check out right and we've all been bin juice in our own time but you were sort of like at was often captain well, yeah. captain like yeah, li fundamentally quite literally, literally the captain literally of, <laughs> yeah. captain of, of team dog was it team fox shit <laughs> yeah or t t team bin juice um, but you're a fierce competitor and a very good player and an athlete. And I wondered, you know, was it quite nice going to that, to kind of the Dragons and then almost the pressure's off, but you're just playing because it's passionate, you're playing because you're fun and all the best bits of rugby were distilled, which is ultimately, I think, the social side and yeah. the kind of working hard, ideally winning under pressure, but if you're losing, still being bonded. Yeah, that I, yeah, definitely. I think as soon as I took the pressure off myself, um, I just became a much better player. Like as soon as I didn't care as much about whether I was going to get an international cap or whether I was starting at the weekend, ironically, you actually start playing better and you yeah. do get those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and it's um, I think up until that point in my career, that my trajectory as a youngster was really steep. Yeah. Like up until nineteen, it was like chatting about potentially playing for England in the next few years, sort of yeah. thing, whatever. And then these shoulder injuries really wiped me out. You know, it was the first time I had a real setback in my life. Do you, do you remember how you coped with them at the time? Um. Well, the first one, I was just like this. It, it happens, you know, right. and just dug in and rehabbed. And I'd already got my had my first team debut, so I thought, okay, this is still going well. Just get sorted. But when I had the second one, the first game back, I was just, you know, it was, I was in a bad place mentally for a while. And actually, I think, you know, taking making decisions to go back to Doncaster, and and I almost gave up because I was like, I don't want to go through that again, that sort of mental state. But um, having been through that at the start of my career yeah. it actually put me in a good position to deal with the lows yeah. when it when they came further down the line I didn't beat myself up if I wasn't starting you know I was just grateful to make it back to Wasps because I thought my career was over at one point I think I had that perspective very early on in my yeah. career and it helped me further down the line right. I mean what what would you say in terms of you look back at now your rugby career as a whole like what what would you say were your highlight moments what would you say were the bits that you uh, aren't as keen on things that I mean perhaps it was injuries or perhaps it was the team socials that you really kind of enjoyed um, 
But I, I love training. Like I, I really enjoy put, putting myself through the mill. You know, yeah. like uh, I like that feeling of feeling that. I know you do as well. Yeah. Feeling absolutely battered after a session and working out in your own head how far you can push yourself. And um, I enjoyed that element of it. And actually, when people say to me about, you know, how do you look back on your rugby career? On paper, I was a bit of a journeyman. You know, played five different clubs, never had any international caps. But like, I, I loved my career. Like, I wouldn't really change it. You know, it would have been nice to get some caps. Mm. But because of the people I met and the friends I've got from the back of it, you know, I played five different clubs across different leagues. It means I've got five times as many yeah. mates. Yeah. You know? And I think people overlook that element of it. And that's that's where you are really lucky as a rugby player to be doing what you love. You love, but it, it's also going to work with fifty other lads who have got similar, who are similarly minded. You know, you always get that. There's a makeup of a squad, right? Yeah. It's like 40 similarly lighted lads, five weirdos, and then just a couple, <laughs> yeah. a couple of bellends. Yeah. yeah, it's the yeah. same in every club Always. you go to. I think, it's, I, I think it's interesting in rugby because most of it, or in professional sports, you actually filter out the knobheads. You know, I mean, I remember went to, um, when I went to the Highlanders, they had a, they had a motto, the GC. And they, I remember the first, the first time I met the coach, I was like, Hesbro, you're a GC? And I was like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking yeah. about. And I was like, what's a GC? You're a good cunt, Hesk. You're a good cunt? I was like, yeah, I think, I, I, I think I'm a good cunt. And that was basically what I always operated that policy. In most things, we, we wheedle out the bad We wheedle out the bad cunts. We keep yeah. the good cunts in, in, yeah. in, in, in the mix. And you were definitely one of those good cunts. Yeah. But I would say we spent most of our time laughing. I, mean, yeah. I, I remember you as always a guy that laughed a lot. Yeah. We laughed, I, we, yeah. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed going yeah. to work. Like, I... And it wasn't, and not just playing at the weekend. And obviously, it's shit sometimes when you're doing mauling sessions at five o'clock and, yeah. and, and, and in like January. And it's, yeah. but and the, this whole scheme of things, I felt I always felt lucky to be a rugby player. And I think a lot of people don't realise it until after they yeah. finish, and actually they don't enjoy the process because they don't step back and go, "Hang on a minute, this is actually this is actually awesome what yeah. we're doing." And you were great for that as, as captain as well, driving. <laughs> Weaving out, we like weeding out the bell ends, yeah. and making sort of just driving the culture as well yeah. as like just the standards on the pitch. I think that's really important. You know, we look at clubs like Exeter; it's just paying off massively yeah. for them on the pitch because they're looking after stuff off it. I mean, it's, it's almost interesting as well in the same in business that a lot of people in business kind of don't feel like they they feel a lot of people in, in normal life don't feel part of something. That's why. They love CrossFit or they love F45 because once in their life, they're suddenly going through a bit of turmoil, putting their body through turmoil. They're enjoying themselves and they feel bonded and they suddenly go, oh my God, I, there's something greater than yourselves. We were very lucky because we had that. As there was actually important. If you didn't tow the party line, you'd let yourself down. And in business, a lot of time, they tried to strive to create those team environments, but often they're quite paper thin until you have to really struggle through something, work through something, and also have someone call you out. Like a lot of people in the real world don't get called out. If you yeah. call someone out now, you're in the, H the HR department. Yeah. We're quite lucky. We were like, that's shit. What yeah, you, yeah. What, 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 are you, what are you doing? It kind of sets you up for later on in life. I think. Yeah. yeah, I definitely agree. And I think it's funny because adversity, I find, like for whether it be for a team or individuals, brings the best out in people. Like you learn more about yourself. You grow more when things are shit or your back's yeah. against the wall. And when we were at Wasp, when I first signed, our backs were against the wall. There was a chance we were going <laughs> to fold, you know, yeah, we were going to yeah. get relegated. Yeah. But that brought the all the boys together you yeah. know it felt like you're in a fight you know you're yeah. not just riding high and individuals are going off and doing their thing you know we we had to scrap to keep you know keep the club afloat you know yeah i mean i arrived the season after that yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I never forget this i don't know i might have told the story before but i i was in uh, new zealand at the time playing behind us they offered me a contract i said listen i can't i've signed for wasps and that was when uh Tom Vandell made his first and only ever tackle and stopped Sam Vesti <laughs> scoring, right? And then I turned up and the first pre-season, like, you know, sponsors evening was in a travel lodge in um, a travel lodge in, in Marlow. And the prizes for the sponsors, there weren't any sponsors. There were three tables. <laughs> it was like a tumbleweed. Uh, uh, and uh, do you remember, um, oh, fuck, what's his, Kirky, David Kirk, yeah, yeah. former sort of referee, sort of, you know, unfunny comedian. I mean, he'll hate this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sort of like child, children's entertainer kind of guy. And then we had, um, and the raffle prizes were a broken box of Spitfire beer, an out-of-date shirt, and I think like a chocolate bar. And I remember walking in there, and they're like, they were paying me good money, and this is my big comeback. I was like, what the fuck? Oh, I got involved. <laughs> yeah. in. And you were like, and all the boys who I'd met that season were like, you've got no idea what this was like before. It yeah. was like awful. Yeah. It was awful. So I mean, like, I mean, it's amazing. Like that, those those kind of moments really 
ground you really and remind you of like yeah yeah it's important to put put yourself through the shit stuff actually to actually actively do it get yeah. outside your comfort zone do things that are uncomfortable and i think sometimes you're forced into that position but if you're not to, to make that a, a priority because yeah. a lot of people like you said going to business a lot of the people at the top of their game in business have almost never failed you know yeah. never failed an exam they go to oxford or cambridge or whatever and they get you know and then but eventually it will come and it's about putting yourself, preparing for those moments by putting yourself in positions where, yeah, you might fail, but it's not failing. It's just grow, learning, yeah. growing, you know, making yourself better, adding those layers to to your character, sort of thing. What I want to talk to you about a, a, a bit of is 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 Lois, who's lovely, it's fit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we missed you. We missed you for our uh, for our anniversary I this know, year. I know. We should probably tell the the, the listeners what a flank. So. I, Imagine the scene, right? You've, you've taken your missus to Soho Farmhouse. You're having a relaxing sort of day and trying to chill them. It's my wife's birthday, so I'm managing her. And then across the uh, across the bar, I'm like, Ed, ask, how are you? Shall we uh, merge? What are you guys doing here? It's our wedding anniversary. Funny that we old... were supposed to go. We were, we were just popping in for lunch. Yeah. And we were going to the place where we got engaged, which was like 10 miles away. We're booked in like perfect first wedding anniversary as well. And we're like, We'll just go for lunch, yeah? <laughs> One bottle of wine. One bottle of wine. Fast forward like <laughs> seven hours. I think, and then we end up going back to our house because you didn't have a place to stay. And at four in the morning, I left you DJing <laughs> on my DJ decks. And all I can do is, woo! And even your missus <laughs> like, Ed, I think it's time to go to bed. And you were like, One more song. But that's actually where you introduced me to Fortet, that, uh, that oh, song. Yeah, yeah. We, when you took over the taxi driver's aux cable. <laughs> We're all like steaming on the in, in the car on the way home. We took it over and we're just having this like real emotional roller coaster journey. Um, I remember waking up in the morning in your house. I think I was in your kitchen so, for some reason and going, "Fuck! I hope Lois is here." Because I couldn't remember what happened the night before, and I, but I'd known we'd gone out for our anniversary, and I thought if I've gone back to Hass and ditched my wife that. and off, yeah. But anyway, well, Tommy had a great birthday. You had a great anniversary. Yeah. But I'm sorry we didn't get to re, you know, reenact yeah, it's always next year, it right? again. But talk to me about, about Lois as well, because she's kind of, I, I think, integral to, to a lot of your story. Like, where did you, where did you meet her? How did you meet? Um, when I was at Bath Academy and she was at Bath Uni. So uh, one of my mates um, was going out with one of the netball girls. Lois was a sort of a top netballer. And we went to a fancy dress party of, and it was what you want to be when you grow up. And I was a fireman. She was a ballerina and... And I remember she, I was a bit drunk, but I remember offering to go to the shops for everyone, like to get drinks. And I got into I got into Sainsbury's and just completely forgot why I was there. So I just bought myself four Stellas and walked out. And I got back in the room. And that is suit. so you yeah, as well. I know. <laughs> and I, I saw when well, I was as soon as I walked in, I opened the door and she was staring at me, and I knew oh, I've completely blown this here. And I was like, really sorry, I just forgot and bought bought Stella. She was like, don't worry, I love Stella. And that's when I kind of fell in love. And uh, but, I love yeah, that. and um, but yeah, we, we so that was eleven years ago. We've been together for a long time, married for three now, uh, about two and a half. Um, but yeah, she's yeah, she's my rock. She's amazing. Like she she seriously adds a lot, not just to our lives, but to me as a person. It's made me a lot better person, and a lot of the stuff we'll get onto. And I've been through over the last sort of four and a half years. I c I couldn't have done it without right. her. That's what I want. That's why I kind of wanted to to to, to talk about. But she is incredible. Um, you know, she's sort of long, like, you know, like normally you say when they're like 60 or 70, you say like long suffering wife, like <laughs> in the background of everything that you do, she's there. Like she, you know, you're up a mountain. She's there. Yeah. You're walking, doing a zoom. She's there. Half the time she's like hundred meters ahead of you. <laughs> and then we'll hold the phone up for an Instagram live and you'll be in the background and she'll be like, oh, fuck yeah, man. I know. But she, to be honest, no, no, she's way more capable than I am. And now she, she's really coming to the fore now. So she's qualified as a life coach now. She's helping partners of people who have gone through like oh, wow. um, traumatic situations. Because, you know, when you get injuries like mine or, or illnesses, or whatever it might be, it yeah, it happens to the individual, but it happens to everyone who cares for them as well. Yeah. And actually, a lot, of the, a lot of the time, the best way to help the individual is to help their support network because that's what they rely on. But a lot of them get overlooked and they're going through their own mental battles, feeling helpless about not being able to do anything. So Lois is doing that now. She's writing a bit more and and she's starting to get the recognition we all know she deserves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I imagine as well that there's probably a little bit of guilt associated because one of the things I'm going to ask you later on, but I'm, I'll come on to, but I imagine there's a lot of guilt associated with the person who's gone through the trauma. It's happened to them and their life's changed. But how can the person around you feel bad and be going through a turmoil because how how, how yeah. can they do that that's, that's so interesting actually to explore that so how, i mean how 
how did she get into that? Because I, I, as I said, I can imagine, you know, if if it happened to me, Chloe, my wife, is such an emotional person that she would be going through that stuff. But if she was to start owning her emotions and saying this has happened, everyone would be like, hold on a minute, love, you're not the one yeah. with a fucking broken neck. Like, how dare you? But you're right. When you love someone that much, and, and also how the profound, how much yeah. stuff is, it affects you. Uh, you know, you have this vision for life and suddenly someone's come along and rip it up, ripped it up for whatever reason. Yeah. You're sort of going along the, the journey too. Yeah. So how did she get into that? Yeah, mate, you bang on. Like, it's people feel like they can't say anything because they've, you know, it's like, what, what can I cry about when there's something else? But yeah. actually, I speak to a lot of people who are going, going through similar situations that I've been through, you know, supporting other people. Like, I was supported by, you know, that peer-to-peer -peer sort of relationship. And more often than not, it'll be the mum or the wife or the husband going through it worse, the worst mentally, than the actual person with the spinal cord injury. Yeah. Um, but they don't feel like they can open up about it because, you know, it's not about them. You know, that's that kind of mentality. Yeah. Um, and actually, we went through that process as a couple. Like, it got to about 18 months and things weren't great. Yeah. Like, we, she was supporting me, but she wasn't happy. I was happy. I was happy. You know, yeah. I was like back walking, you know, starting the charity. And she actually went start started to go and see a therapist and, and she... She could because she'd been bottling it up for a long time, and it all came down to the fact. And she plucked up the confidence eventually to come and speak to me and say, "Look, these are the things that I'm struggling with. You know, you, you're the same person mentally, but all of your values have changed in terms of you're driving towards different things. You look different, you even smell different. Sometimes I struggle with the fact that it feels like I'm with a different person, right? And not in a negative way, but she was just really hard. She was struggling through that transition, yeah. but didn't feel like she could voice it. And as soon as she did, and we sat down and talked about it, it's just been up." uphill from then from then on mate that's mad like you take those things for granted as well and because you know I have to be very careful about this but I, you know uh, on the whole women are much more emotional animals you know we're, we're very practical problem solving initially women are, are much more emotional you know feeling and their, their feminine energy and how uh, it's very different it's amazing she said that and, and was able to do that. And what did that, when, when she sort of confronts you with that, what do you, what do, you do with that? Because it, sometimes it's quite hard to compute. Like when my wife says certain things to me, it's very difficult to take yourself outside of yourself and start being more emotional because I'm very practical. Like, well, what do you mean? Of course I don't fucking smell different. Of course I, I'm, yeah. I look a bit different. But how did you compute that? It was, it was hard to hear, to be fair, to start with because I was already struggling with the fact that I look completely different. You know, I was... I mean, you'd struggle with this more than anyone, but when I was sat yeah. in the hospital bed for three weeks, I lost three stone and just muscle mass. It wasn't good weight to lose because yeah. your body just atrophies when you're not using your yeah. muscles at all. So I had a bit of an identity crisis and actually like I was probably, after I came out of hospital, just overdoing the upper body weights and stuff, just trying to get back to what it was before. But actually that wasn't normal to be like that yeah. you know, as a rugby player. And now I'm comfortable the way I am yeah, now. Yeah. But for her to say... You know, you look different, you smell different. I knew it in my head, but then I was like, oh shit, my wife doesn't find me attractive anymore. And it's yeah. that ego slash. But actually it was, you know, it, like I said, it was the best that it had to be said. And actually she'd been bottling up for months, you know, yeah. it was eating her up inside. And 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 once she did, it, it lays the marker down and then you build from there. Yeah. That's and amazing. actually, we, I think as blokes, we probably put more emphasis on the way we look than women actually think. Agre like, agreed. I, I think blokes are driven much more by what they see, yes. right? But women are driven by security, emotional stability, and all of those yes. sorts of things that make them laugh. Yeah, humor, exactly. Comfort, security. Are they being heard? Yeah, and are all they... of those things hadn't I hadn't lost, or or I no. could still have. I had lost the way I looked, but that doesn't really matter in the. In I mean, the I think maybe my wife's always been kind to me <laughs> because I'm not. I'm no oil painter. I'm not going to win any model. <laughs> what like they watch face like crime watch. <laughs> I um. But she always says that to me. She goes, you fucking lads just don't have any idea. Like, it's not about that. Yes, there's obviously initial attraction. You know, luckily she likes bearded big men with tattoos. That's my yeah, sort yeah. of entry level thing. But it's the, it's everything else. It's like, do you make them feel laughed? Are they made me hurt? Are they being heard? You know, are you, um, you know, being, you know, sort of comforting them? Do they, do they, do you m meet those kind of emotional requirements? Yeah. So yeah, so so obviously you work through that, and you're you're here, you know, and and stronger yeah, than and, ever. And I managed to move the focus off the fact that I look different onto right. being a better boyfriend. Partner. I don't think. I mean, when you say look different, what do you mean by look? Well, different? no, I think. I mean, I think it's still sexy as fuck. I, mean. <laughs> I don't <laughs> Thanks, know, mate. No, no, I'm not even not. Um, not but, no, it, and that, but that, that's how I took it. But actually, all she meant was you look different, yeah. like not in a bad way, no. but you just are different. And yeah. I'm having to get used, to, I've going through a transition, getting used to that as well. 
like she said, sometimes she felt like she was cheating on me, you know, even though it was, it was me. me. Yeah. Like, yeah. Some couples quite like that. Just yeah. like to mix it up. That's why they say the old, um, if you sit on your hand, it goes numb. When you put a ladies wristwatch on it and paint the nails, they call it the stranger. The lads <laughs> That's why you've always had paint and nails <laughs> in training. Yeah. Right. Wank it makes off sense my feet. But yeah. You just make, you just numb your hand, sit on it, paint the nails and wank yourself off. And it's called the stranger. <laughs> That's so a whole other podcast. That, that is a whole <laughs> other podcast. I could do a podcast on sex advice because I'm bloody good. Um, but so, I mean, we've talked to better, better. I don't want to skirt around it but and sort of go over it again because you must talk about it a hundred times and obviously we're going to talk about Lucky, your book, which is which is out now. But do you want to talk to me about the, the accident and what and what we're talking about because we skirted about it, how it happened yeah. and what exactly happened? Yeah, so um, I suppose you did the rugby bit. I was at Dragons. I was 28. I like, enjoyed, really enjoyed my career, taking the pressure off. I was playing well. Just signed two more years. Bought a house down there. And then I had another shoulder injury. I managed to avoid having a shoulder injury for about seven years. And no one even noticed that I never tackled with my left shoulder. I just got very good at pushing people off in different directions. And Yours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I recovered from a shoulder injury and a shoulder up. Went back to a family friend's house. We've got a swimming pool because it was like the first hot day of the year, April the 8th, 2017. And after lunch, just went down to the pool. They had like a rock feature in one end, waterfall. And I just dived in where the waterfall hit the water, thinking it was like eight feet deep. Turned out to only be about three feet deep. And I smacked my head on the bottom of the pool. Um, and I remember whacking it and going, you know, yeah, that that hurt. That was a big, sh big hit. But I'll just make sure I stand up and check I'm not bleeding in the pool. And when I tried to stand up, that's when I realized someone was wrong because I couldn't, I couldn't move. And that was obviously confusing at first because you're used to being able to move when you tell your body to do it. But then very quickly turned like, from confusion to panic so I was underwater so I was still looking at the surface and, and you you know, remember I was going to drown I remember it all clear as day like it was um, and but luckily my dad was in the pool and one of my mates and they pulled me to the surface and my dad's a retired doctor so he knew to keep me still so he was like held my head in the pool and they floated me in the pool then for about 45 minutes till the ambulance came and then the ambulance journey to hospital what I'd done is I'd dislocated the C6 and C7 vertebrae at the bottom of my neck and the impact on the top of my head was so hard, the disc between had exploded and cut my spinal cord in half. So what was 12 millimetres across was now six. So I was in a pretty vulnerable position because my neck was still dislocated and a lot of damage that's caused in spinal cord injuries is actually after the accident, the way people are handled. Obviously, I was lucky that they immobilised me straight away. But what I didn't find out until a year later is that 15-minute journey to hospital in the, in the ambulance actually took two and a half hours because they pulled over three times to resuscitate me. So I actually died three times as well, which um, in, in my mind, it wasn't like pearly gates or, you know, stay away from the light. I just felt a bit sleepy and they were, I remember them trying to keep me awake. And I thought the trip, I thought it only took 15 minutes. I don't even remember getting resuscitated. I just sort of thought I was dozing off. Um, so that puts a different spin on like, obviously I'm very lucky to be walking around, but I'm lucky to be here at all, to be honest. Um, and then I had a seven hour operation in Southmead Hospital, amazing surgeon called Neil Barua who saved my life and I woke up, but I woke up in intensive care um, and I still had no movement or sensation. So that wasn't a great start. And, and then actually after day six or seven, I still had no movement or sensation. And that's when they gave me the prognosis that I wasn't going to walk again and that hopefully I'll get the use of my arms back so that I could use a wheelchair. Fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. Like I've, I've heard you tell bits of it before, but I'm, I'm not very good with stuff like that. Like I don't, because I, because I think because you we played a sport that you put your body in danger sometimes and like I jumped into stuff and fucked my head onto stuff and everything else like that and I'm like you know when you're younger you're sort of a bit more of a daredevil I'm now firmly in the seat of like I panic about doing everything now like I yeah. just gotta take it easy because I've escaped this long and I have you know I was there when Matt Hampson broke his neck went into that scrum obviously I know I know you I've got other I've got other friends yeah. and stuff happens and you're just it's You'd like, rather shelter yourself from it. I was, yeah, yeah. It's like ignorance is bliss, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, la 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 la. <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep, yeah. Because like, yeah. I think when you once you appreciate how fragile the human body is, that's why I've always like admired you know people who work in police and fire and stuff and ambulance and paramedics and stuff and and like A and E because the shit they see and the stuff mm. they do, it's very easy to go like just keep watching Arnie movies and slow movies yeah, yeah. and stuff like that, and it's fine. So I mean, how well? First of all. I want to take you back to those, those, those times. So when you've woken up in hospital and they, and I mean, what are they, what are they saying to you? What are you, what are you thinking at that time? When I, when I woke up in intensive care, the first sort of three or four days were just 
luckily in the during the day you have your friends and family there to distract you so i'm always almost putting a show on for them because i felt guilty about what i'd done and the emotional stress i put on everyone so i was just like you know putting a smiley face on but at that point i didn't have any power from like the shoulders down so i couldn't breathe for myself uh i could breathe myself just about but i couldn't cough enough to clear my throat so every time a bit of saliva would go in my throat i'd feel like i was drowning I had a buzzer, but I couldn't press it because I couldn't move. So I had to learn how to like get inside my head. And that's when I started learning mindfulness and breath work just to, as a survival technique. Because if I panicked and tried to breathe in harder, I was just choking. Couldn't go to the toilet for myself. So you got someone you've just met yesterday with their finger up your bum every morning, pulling poo out. And you just you just hope, hope it's the lovely little Filipino nurse and not Big Dave who comes <laughs> in in the morning. Dave. You know, but, Big um, Dave. So all these bizarre scenarios and you've just lost... I felt like I'd lost my identity completely because I suppose I was a professional sportsman before and now I was just sort of a head on a pillow that was being having to be fed, washed, looked after. So at night when my family had to leave, you know, at 8 p.m., it was brutal. I was dark. You know, some of the thought processes I went through, you know, I'm very lucky to not, knowing people that do, I'm very lucky to not suffer with mental health conditions. Yeah. But I felt what it's like to think those thoughts and that's why I've got so much more sympathy and respect for it now and i know we, we you know we our stuff we do with restart you know i think before it would have been quite easy for me to just brush over oh yeah one of the boys is you know saying they're down whatever yeah. now it's like no nah, if that's proper then it can be crippling and i felt it and and it but luckily after day seven the doctor came in and basically said look you're not going to walk again and i had the weirdest reaction you know it did feel feel like getting punched in the gut because if i sat here and said I always knew that I'd be back on my feet. I'd be lying. You know, I thought, you know, I'm just, I'm just hoping I'd get some use of my arms back to be independent. Um, uh, but I remember he sort of laid the benchmark out. He laid the, drew the line in the sand. We'd all been thinking it, but no one had said it. And I was like, the only way is up from here now. So I just started doing everything I could. Every waking moment, I was just staring at my feet and just imagining them moving. And all you can do is visualization. Because I knew that in six months' time or a year's time, if I looked back and I was still in the hospital bed and I was being cared for by, I was still in bed at home, whatever. I was being cared for by Lois or my mum and it was affecting their lives as well. But I knew that I hadn't tried everything. I could, you know, I'd cut corners. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to live with myself. But if I look back in six months time and I was still in the same position I was, but I'd done everything I could, then at least it was out of my hands. So that's the decision I made. And that change of sort of angle of why I wanted to get better stop thinking about me, stop feeling sorry for yourself and start thinking about trying to help your family too was enough motivation for me to put the effort in that after I was told that I would, wouldn't get any movement back below the level of injury, it was only 48 hours before my toe wiggled and movement started coming back because I'd changed that, my mindset had changed. So talk me through the, the show you said you put on for your, for your parents. I mean, what, I mean, hopefully you know, people won't be in a similar situation, but lots of people are, unfortunately, for what, various reasons. Like what? People are going, oh, you'll be okay. I mean, and you're like, will I fuck? Like I can't yeah. swallow. What, what, what? Well, actually, it's the other way around. You're saying, oh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be all right. You know, don't worry, because you don't want to put them through that any more emotional trauma. People don't know how to act around you, right? Oh. Because you don't want to say the wrong thing. And actually, ironically, all you want is for someone to come in and take the piss right. and just be normal. And the rugby lads are pretty good at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I was I like, remember... should have just called me up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You'd have been perfect yeah. in that scenario. But like Cy Mac, I remember, brought brought me three juggling balls and I couldn't move from the shoulders down. He was like, here you go, you give me an ear a while. I might as well practice something. And that was the best thing. <laughs> three, I'd, three that was the best balls. thing I'd heard. Yeah, but that was, that, was, that was great. You know, it was making, I think humor is really important yeah. because... You can, and how, no matter how like harsh or sad a situation is, if you can laugh about yes. it, you can steal its seriousness away from it straight away. But people aren't comfortable to do that unless you're in the same boat. But when, when we're with other people with spinal cord injuries, we are just take, we're like, taking the piss out. We all shit ourselves and piss ourselves <laughs> and tell the best stories about when you had a spasm and punch someone and thing, <laughs> things like that because you, you feel comfortable to do right. it because you're in the same boat. But it's hard when you're not to have the confidence to do that. But... It was certainly a big coping mechanism for me using using that dark humor to get through things. I think it's interesting with the humor stuff because I've done some therapy stuff with different people. And one of the things I think it's Tim Robbins talks about where, where focus goes, energy flows. And the ability, even if you bring it down to just a minor argument with your partner, if you can metaphorically or physically change your attention focus you immediately feel better. And it's exactly yeah. with that. If you, you know, and humor is a way of doing that. If I could, before you lose your temper or get too emotionally down, if I can interrupt it with humor, 
that more often not can change, is exactly yeah. what you said, and sort of save the, the save the day. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've got, it's funny, all these mental processes I went through as part of my recovery, I think were happening naturally as a body's sort of mechanism to defend itself, whether it be yeah. reframing or like I said, learning learning to learning mindfulness because I didn't want to choke. You know, it wasn't because I read it in a book. No. But I've studied a lot of it since, like psychology and philosophy. And that, especially in Buddhism now, but like the and Stoicism, but like the mindful gap where the the the, the gap between stimulus and response, where you've got a choice of how is this going to make me feel? Someone's done something to wind you up. Yeah, okay, you're going to feel that, but you go, hang on a minute. Is that emotion helping me at all? No. Okay, let's move it on. Let's laugh about it. Yeah. You know, and developing that is, you know, it, I mean, I'm still not very good at it. You get better over, over, over life, but it was really important in hospital because you're in such a posi- you're in such a serious position. You know, are you ever going to walk again? Are you ever going to be independent again? You, it's funny how your brain naturally comes up with those defense mechanisms to distract you or reframe situations and start to think instead of, oh, I'm so, un, you know, I'm so unlucky that I've dived in the pool and broken my neck. It's, no, you're lucky your dad was there and you're alive and you're even here. And when you change that sort of perspective on life and start to look at the positive mm-hmm. side, everything else seems to fall into place. And that, that happened naturally for me in hospital. And it's something I still work on today. And actually, I know we get onto the book, but a lot of the book is, is a, is touches on those mental processes I went through and how they help me now in day-to-day life. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a story about someone going through a life-changing incident and the family and friends around them. And it's, it's, it's a positive story at the end of the day, but there's also like, there's lessons in there and takeaways that anyone can sort of put into their own life as well. I think it's, it's insane. I mean, one of the, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, um, when you say it got dark in the in the night, because I I've mulled this over many times when you know I've hurt myself or I've done stuff, I put myself in situations um, that could could have you know potentially paralyzed me, done whatever, um, and I always wonder how I would handle it. And I always use you know Matt Hampson is a great example. You know he's got a fantastic um, foundation and get busy living. And I always think, you know, he he handled the whole situation so well in terms of what he did. And but there was another player actually at the same time. I think maybe a year or two years afterwards. I can't remember what his name was, but he took he took himself off to Dignitas, where his parents did, and he ended his life. And I I always wondered what you would do in that situation, whether because you were a big character, because you were fun, life and soul of the party, and obviously someone had said to you, "You're not going to walk again." When you're sitting there in bed at night, like. What, what what do you think? Do you think fuck this? Yeah. It's better to be better to be dead than to be alive, or or without being too morbid, or does that yeah. not enter your head? I, or what? Yeah, I had those thoughts, and you try and bat them away as quickly as possible. And in those first six seven days, I've had those thoughts. But once you start seeing some progress, as soon as my toe wiggled, that was it. Like, but I still had to deal with for a long time that loss of purpose. You know, everyone doing stuff for you. You're like, am I? You're just a bird. You feel like a burden on everyone. But you know, like. I the Hambo is just like he's been a massive inspiration for me from day one because when I woke up in hospital I was bad like it was a high level injury but I could breathe for myself and Hambo still can't breathe for himself and look what he's done yeah. and what he's doing and I just thought from the start you know if he can do that then what excuse have I got you know that's really helped me move those mental the the, the thoughts of I should end it because I was already better off than Hambo and look what he's doing with his life. So he's inspired me hugely without even knowing it from the start, just by, you know, the, the things he's gone through. But fortunately for me, you know, I did get really lucky. I had, I've made progress. And when, when you're moving in the right direction, you know, and you get a bit more perspective on life and you start to understand what's important. And I'm in a much better place mentally now than I was before my accident, which is just, you know, weird, weird thing to say, but it's just because on paper, everything's actually got a lot worse. But the way I look at everything has completely changed, so it, it's got a lot better. So I've just started sort of appreciating everything a lot more, trying new things, being more confident, realizing that failure isn't a thing, not sweating the small stuff. All of these sorts of things have come as a result of that terrible accident. I mean, I was going to, I was going to ask you sort of towards the end of it. I mean, you know, in terms of what you achieved and have achieved now, and are continue to achieving, you know, it, is it fair to? I mean, you don't, we don't know what would happen if you hadn't, but. You know, you were like you said. We talk about playing for, playing in in Wales, Capulo, lucky, enjoying sort of that journeyman vibe. Now you are you've set up a charity. Uh, you know, you have you know millimeters to mountains. You've got your book out. You've got your you, you know you've locked your misses down. You you 
are raising amazing money, you're doing stuff with Restart, you have found, you know, you've got more purpose, you're doing adventures that only I could dream of that I haven't, you know, I can't done. I'm apparently able-bodied, even though I limp, <laughs> limp around everywhere. Um, you know, you must, you know, yeah, you must make give you pause for thought to sort of think, you know. Um, they, what, yeah, I, I definitely. And, uh, but this has come as a result of, you know, it's a thing in psychology, it's post, post-traumatic growth. You know, it's, I just wondered why it was happening, but now if you put research into it, it's a, it's a mental process and people go one of two ways. They either become victim mentality, why me? You know, and I was in that stage in the first week or active agent where they do something about it and they start feeling sorry for themselves. And w- when I've done that and I've moved the perspective of my life on and realized how lucky I am to even be here, yeah. never mind like before to make me happy, you'd have to get man of the match or you'd have to be picked again or you'd something would have to go really well. Now the fact I can just walk down the stairs and brush my own teeth makes me happy. Yeah. So it's a lot easier to get yeah, happy, yeah, just move yeah. that bar. But when you do that, like you said, all of these things that I'm doing now, I wouldn't have ever dreamt I'd be able to do. And yeah, there's the element of the old cripple perks involved. You know, people <laughs> pe- 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 people want to help you out and is open that, doors. Is that but a technical you, term? Yeah, technical term, yeah. Right up to Tesco's. You, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, blue badge is almost worth it in itself. But it's it's actually just because my, mind, my mindset's changed. Right. And I've I've just realized what is there to lose in life. Like, follow your passions. Why not try and set up a charity that you climb mountains and take other people with you and save their lives? Like, why not? Why not? Before I'd be like, well, obviously not. That's ridiculous. Yeah. How hard would that but now be? I don't, yeah. Yeah. But now it's like, fuck it, go for it. Yeah. And actually, you realize you're way more capable than you thought you were. Yes. I never thought I could write a book. No. But I never thought I could write anything. But no. I started in hospital and then you realize, oh shit, I could. And a lot of people have those limiting beliefs on them, whether beliefs on themselves, whether they put it there themselves or society puts it there. It's like, no, you're an accountant. You know, that's all you get yeah. at. It's mass, you know, and you believe that it's bollocks. You can try anything and go for it. And and it's the freedom comes from not having a fear of failure, I think, because you realize actually what's the worst can happen. If I get on stage and talk in front of those thousand people, what's the worst can happen? Piss myself? That'd be quite funny. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know and you've got um, a perfect excuse. Yeah, it's not, I'm well. not exactly an intensive care struck fighting but, for my life, you no. know, and, and you do, I really do believe, I know it's cliche, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And people, you know, if you survive the tough times, you become more resilient. I'm I'm interested when you said so. So so the doctors walked in and said, "Right, you're not going to walk again," which you said was sort of a relief because everyone been skirting around the issue. Must have been traumatic for everyone because I, I don't think you can fully appreciate what that's like to have that said to you when you can't feel anything and you know that potentially looked to be true. How do you then set goals from that point of view? Like you know, like what was kind of your path of development or where'd you go because you know like sometimes if you have a a, a lower limb injury as a rugby player or a shoulder injury you rehab my idea is to get back playing again when someone has said to you you can't walk anymore what do you set the yeah. target how did you find that mental strength to try and set any goals yeah it's a good question and i think at the start i was thinking too far ahead you know what i, I was hoping i'd be you know, I was dreaming of myself and actually the one of the actually I'm diverging a little bit here, but when you you one of the hardest things is your dreams, because you still dream as you're able bodied. So every time you wake up, it hits you again that you're disabled. You've been running around in your dreams and doing stuff like that. But so I was dreaming to be able bodied again. Um and actually thinking too far ahead or thinking about what was what I don't how could I have not dived in the pool or what could I have done differently was just meaning I was sat there all day staring at the ceiling, just like in bits and I realized actually by moving the focus closer so like what can I do right now to try and improve whether that's visualize moving my toe 500 times or when I start to get bits back I'm just trying to move my le- like middle finger on my right hand a millimeter further that became my target each day rather than what's the rather than the end goal and you, you feel like you're never getting closer to it so you beat yourself up and by being able to tick off those little bits of progress and seeing progress it keeps you motivated and then the bigger stuff happens. And you're very right that in rugby, you, know, you disc your shoulder, you do an ACL, there's a roadmap back to playing. You can almost pick a, a game in like nine months time, or whatever, and go, I'm, I'm aiming for that. Yeah. So it motivates you, you know, you're yeah. on a journey. With this, it was just open-ended. That's what I mean, which is one of the hardest things because they, yeah. they, they, do they do a type of training called suspension of disbelief training where they go, right, do, do, give me 30 press-ups, you do 30 press-ups, give me 10 more. They're like, you'll be five more, you'll be three. And you never know when it's going to end. Yeah. And it ends when it ends until you're fucked and you can't do it. Yeah. And for you to sit there, but I mean, where do you think the, the mental strength came from to be able to do that? Like, who was someone whispering in your ear? Were you getting therapy? 
was with some with people suggesting this shit to you because I you know it's a big there is a big disconnect from going at night sitting with your demons to putting on a show in the morning to being told you can't walk to then going I'm going to focus on moving my finger a minute I would have done what you done going you know how do I either given up or you think about mad stuff that you can't how did you bring yeah. it back to a micro micro management of of your goals I think it was partly necessity like a lot of these things was just human instinct weird, weirdly like I think if someone told me if I'd been able to manage this process the way I have I would have said no way you know before the accident and people say that they're like oh I could never have done what you did but I was like you don't know until your back's against no. the wall humans are amazing like species you know not everyone does it but you're probably more resilient than you give yourself credit for so a lot of it was that but then also I through the blog I'd started being contacted by other people who'd had spinal cord injuries before some of them Paralympians and some of them who had really gone on and done different things. So I was using them as a sounding board because they could, I could also be a hundred percent honest with them because I didn't worry. I wasn't worried about upsetting them and they could relate to everything. So the things that I was holding back from my family or Lois. Like what would you be holding back? Like what kind of thing? Like, like I felt like I wanted to kill myself last right, night. Fine. You know, right, yeah, fine. That's not going okay, okay, to okay, benefit anyone. You or, did, but you never you had that conversation talk to your with Lois. About, I'm just worried if I'm ever going to be able to get hard on again, you know, yeah. and things like that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you yeah. can speak to people Mom who... does not need to know that. Yeah. yeah. And that peer support is so important and they they massively gave me, yeah, and some of them are still re I'm re really good friends with and um, things like move it shorter term goals, focus on this. You know, a lot of it came from external advice and the other half came from like instinct. Really. Did you ever tell your mum and dad that? Because I, I, I'm i not great at controlling my emotions a lot of the time. I, I, I'm relatively calm a lot of the time, but then if I lose it, I, I lose it badly, but sometimes it can come out like I'm a bit of a bottler. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, and if if someone was fussing over me or something, at some point I would have gone, "Listen, just fuck off! I want to fucking kill myself. I don't want to yeah, be yeah, here." Yeah, because well, yeah, as soon as someone goes, "Yeah, that's normal," I thought that I used to think that all the time. You know, you're like, "Oh, okay," you don't worry about it anymore, and they, then those thoughts become less and less, and you understand that they're fleeting emotions. Like they, it's all just part of evolutionary biology. Your bo your brain is scared, you know, and something bad will happen that day, or you won't make any progress, and your thought is, "Well, I want to tap out here," but it's not. You being weak, it's just understanding that that is a thought and that's normal to think that. Rationalize it and move it on. And other people who've been through it before, they're the best people to help you do that. Better, better so than like professional therapists. You find more yeah. value in in them than the you know the normal uh, people. I think so. Like I've met some amazing professional therapists, and I just and I you know I just think that even if they're not saying something different than the professional, because it's coming from someone who's been there before it just sinks in a bit better. Right. You know, it's not taking anything away from no. therapists, but it's also quite a niche topic, you know, and to find someone who is, who has had a spinal cord injury and has overcome it and then is willing to speak to other people and motivate other people and can, you know, even they might have all these feelings, but they might not be able to get it across well. And that's what therapists are very, very good at. But I was lucky to, to know a couple that were just brilliant um, for me and still mentor me now. And and that was because I had a bit of a shop window being a rugby player. There's a bit of, you know, press around it, whatever. So they reached out and, um, but not everyone has that luxury, no. you know, and that's why I've now made it very clear to all the spinal units. I get contacted quite regularly by people who have recently had injuries or their partners or families um, because I know how important that peer sport is because I felt it the other way around. And you don't feel like, you've, you, you know, that's something you enjoy. There's no burden on you. You actively want to do it because of the value you had in it. I mean, helping someone is the most powerful like thing you can do for yourself, mm. like for your own self esteem. And I found that in bucket loads. Like I, I felt like a completely lost purpose after the accident. Everyone was having to look after me. But then when I started feeling like I could help other people, a few months later through the blog, people started saying, "Oh, this is really helping me get through what I'm going through." That feeling was just unbelievable, and it made me find some purpose again. Hence, why now I've taken it to the extremes of like starting a charity. But people don't understand the power of doing something for someone else, doing mm. it, having a completely selfless act. And it's not selfless because it makes you feel good. Yes. And that's okay. Yeah. If you want to make yourself feel better, don't try and make yourself feel better. Go and make someone else feel better. Yeah. And you'll immediately feel good. Yeah. I think it's, I, I actually talk to certain uh, friends and people about certain things along those lines, saying actually, you know, doing something with, that, with no benefit for yourself, you. All you know, you automatically get the benefit because you've done something yeah, outside get, of yourself. The ironic thing is, you get more benefit. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. It, and, and, and you'll be, always be disappointed in life if you go to help people and the expectation they're going to help you. The expectation yeah. is, I'm going to do this because it might not be that person, but it will be somebody else that you will ultimately get that that feeling. Yeah. And it's and even like 
you know, without being too sort of uh, holistic or kind of hippie-ish, is that, you know, I, I called someone today and had a conversation. I just thanked them yeah. for doing something, just thanked them profusely and said, you know, I couldn't have done this without you. And I could hear in their voice, they were like... You could have quite easily not done that, no. right? And I, and, I, and actually, it's, it, and, and weirdly enough, it's something that I really appreciate. And it's interesting that you really benefited from that and being able to reach out and now you bring it to bring that support to other, to so many people. Yeah, and that, it's that ripple effect, right? Yeah. It seems like such a small thing, but honestly, that'll change someone's mood. Then they'll go and do it to other people. And you can, you know, these small acts of kindness can have a massive effect. We underestimate them. We're like, what's the point of sending a thank you message? It's only a message. Yeah. But then that'll change that person's mood. Well, it's what your mum says, anyway. Every time you get a present when you were younger, send a thank you card. She's like, whatever, mum, make a phone yeah. call. <laughs> it's fucking, turns out mum's are right yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how, how did your pr progress go? So you said that you were told... Uh, you're not going to walk, and then you stared at your toe, and we're like, "Move, motherfucker, move!" <laughs> yeah, uh, and it, what it started moving. Yeah, like two days later, it just started wiggling, and I was telling it to move. And sometimes I'd get spasms, so it'd be like a false, be like, "Oh fuck, it's going," but it's not. It's just right, a spasm. Right. Um, so first of all, I thought it was a spasm, and the weird thing was, I couldn't feel my legs. Like Lieutenant Dan can't feel my <laughs> legs, but <laughs> yeah, like yeah. He, they're attached to you, but you don't feel like it's part of your body. So you're telling it to move. You remember how to send those, send those signals, but you don't. And then all of a sudden it started moving and then it moved again and again. I was like, oh my God, this is actually me doing this. I was like, mom, get in here. She was just outside the room. And sure enough, I was wiggling my toe. And that was that meant so much. I started getting a bit of movement back in my hand, but that was kind of expected because it was above the level of the yeah. injury. But to have a sign that there was connections still below the level of the injury just completely changed sort of the outlook on everything. And, you know, it wasn't out, we weren't out of the woods yet by any means, but it was what all we needed like all I needed emotionally to kick on was that like next level <coughs> excitement like when that happens because you it's know people, the most it, powerful feeling of emotion I've ever had in my life really half my wedding yeah, yeah, was, I mean, yeah when, when I said I love you yeah, yeah. yeah. no I, I um, wonder that because people because again everything you're saying is about a changing of perspective a reframing and the different optics you look at, look through and you know and, and it's always harder to put yourself in other people's shoes and see things differently and like you said if the best part of your day is moving your toe yeah. in comparison to someone who's just bought a Lamborghini yacht yeah. and if that's that it's all relative and that's why I think I've talked to another podcast about the loss of context context to you is very different to context to me I mean what, what are you we must have gone what did you mean you shout at your mum and then we're like right fuck this move. yeah you know. it was just mate and then you just want to keep doing it because you don't want to lose it so you're just there wiggling my toe all day <laughs> until I was like fall asleep and wake up wiggle my toe um but for the, like I said before, I'd moved my mindset on to this wasn't just about me. This was about everyone that was potentially going to have to care for me for the rest of my life. So I felt like I, at that point, my biggest driver was giving Lois a good life. You know, right. we were engaged. You know, I was like, you didn't, and and we'd already had the, I'd already had the conversation. You know, you didn't sign up for this. You need to leave me. That's what I was going to ask you, like yeah. how that affected you and what 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 happened? Did you because in some some of the movies you see, I mean, I haven't gone through it where they just say, "Leave me, you yeah. didn't sign up for this, you don't want to be with this." Yeah. Like you feel guilty, you're like full of guilt because you've dived in the wrong end of a fucking swimming pool. You know, it's not, and it is an accident, right? Yeah, and, and I I did feel, I felt a lot more guilty mm -hmm. at the start, where as actually when I went to the spinal unit when I moved to Salisbury after like seven weeks, and I was, all of a sudden I was surrounded by fifty other people with spinal cord injuries, some worse off, some better off. Um, I realised it wasn't just full of idiots or bad people. It was full of a complete cross section of society, and some some of them had like injured themselves and could never walk again. From like picking one guy, Rick, who's picking his toddlers up, like off the floor, had a bulging disc, and his disc blew out. Shut up! I've uh, got like, three bulging discs in my neck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, and and some people, it's all mundane. I was thought I was going to go in there and be surrounded by like Red Bull athletes yeah. and you know stunt men and stuff, but it's just not the case. And then you realise actually. This is just chance, you know, shit yeah. things happens to good people yes. and good things happen to shit people, yes. you know, it's just life. Life happens to us, not for us. So then I, I stopped feeling so guilty myself. I realized it was just an accident and that really helped me deal. With, and and what did she deal. say though when you said, when you said to Lois and approached her, because we like, she must have obviously been scared and going through the fears you've talked about, hence why she's helping people now. But when you said, listen, you didn't sign up for this. I don't expect you to hang around and look after it. Well, how did she take that? She told me to shut up. Stop <laughs> right. being so stupid. Like she shut it down pretty quickly, and I was terrified having that conversation. But I needed to because I just felt so guilty about what this could potentially mean for our lives. Yeah, and her life. Yeah, I didn't want her to have to be my full time carer, and I knew that was a possibility. And and even though I was going to give it everything I got, a lot of it's out of my hands. Right, you yeah. can only recover to within the scope of your injury. You know, it's not 
I, I haven't just like tried harder than Henry <laughs> yeah, Fraser yeah, and Matt yeah. Hampson. They've got worse injuries than me, yeah. you know? And I've just been lucky that I've been able to have that opportunity to improve. But I, I didn't know that at the time. I, and I thought, look, if this is going bad, I don't want Lois to be with me because it would take, break me even more. Yes. Thinking I hadn't just done this to me, I'd done it to other people. But she told me to shut up and get on with it. And I think she was stuffed then, isn't she? Because we're engaged. If she left me just because I broke my neck, she yeah, was like, she bad was, she PR. Was terrible, wouldn't it? Bad PR, PR yeah. yeah. You fully locked her in. Because I reckon if she, yeah, if she, we weren't engaged, you were gone, mate. Yeah. Pop, pop you in a weedie bin and fucked yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> Parked you out by the bins and left. Um, I mean, how, I mean, I mean, do you look at that, how that's kind of changed your relationship? Do you, do you ultimately feel close? I imagine something like that has brought you closer. Do you then appreciate those moments, but you don't sweat the, like the little stuff anymore? Mate, I'm, I'm so, yeah, there's that. She gets pissed off at me because I've become annoyingly positive because of that <laughs> perspective. Sometimes she comes home from work. She's like, I just want to fucking whinge about something. I'm there like, but look, put it, like, look at the bright oh, side. No. Like, yeah, 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 just, yeah. It's just the way my mind works. So it's just constant reframing. But um, no, on the scheme of things, we, I'm, I'm so lucky, mate. I mean, I know you feel, feel the same, just like, I don't believe there's a thing as a soulmate. Like, you, there's lots of people you'd be very compatible with. It's just when you're in your circles. But I think I've got pretty close. Like, yeah. I get on with her so well. We could just spend all the time just us two. And it's fine. You know, obviously, we have our Barneys and yeah. stuff. Like every couple does. But she's like my best mate as well as as well as my wife. And, and I feel so grateful for that. And for the, for the reasons, not just because it means I've got a great day to day. You know, when yeah. I'm home, I'm happy. When I go to work, I'm happy. We now work together, you know, with a charity. Um, but also it was that added motivation for me to get better because I really wanted to do it for her. And and did did she motivate? Because, you know, sometimes some partners, they sort of want to, they're facilitators, you know, so they go, oh, you're doing so well. And they sort of um, don't really want to push you. When she saw your appetite to get better, did she push you? And then, because and then, I think sometimes it's kind of sometimes it's a nice balance of a partner to reward your efforts. But also not to champion mediocrity, to also yeah. say, actually, listen, you fuck, you take your foot off the gas here. Yeah. Is she that kind of person? Yeah, she is. She's great. Like, and it happens sometimes. You know, when you're having to rehab every day for the rest of your life, you're gonna have times where you're like, fuck, this, <laughs> yes. like, get the dominoes yeah. in. And I do regularly, but as long as it only happens <laughs> yeah. briefly, you know. And she's good. She she like, come on, you're slipping here. Yeah. It's like we went to the pub and you had four cigarettes instead of one when you were pissed. You <laughs> yeah. know. And it's just and and. I think that's important. I think that is really important in a in a healthy relationship that you can pull each pull each other up on stuff. And I feel like we both do that to each other. Um, I feel like she makes me a lot better person, and I'd like to think that I make her a better person too. Um, I don't want you to dob people in, but were there people who who let you down in this situation? The people that people who just have sort of ran ran for the hills. Yeah, um, not. Not obviously, like not people that really let you down. It just surprises you how you get some people who are really on the fringes in your life just yeah. come to the forefront and they're there all the time and they're just being amazing. And some people you'd expect to be there all the time just aren't. Right. Um, but we've got to understand it's just the way people are processing it themselves. Yeah. And some people are the type of character that jumps to action when there's a crisis and some people hide from it. It doesn't make them a good person or a bad person. It's just the, their their character. And coming to terms with that was, you know, understanding that was important because I think there was probably, yeah, a few people I'd probably expect to be about a bit more. And look, this is coming from someone who I was so lucky, like to have the network I had and the family I had. I had people in my room every day. There were people in hospital who didn't have anyone the whole time I was in the spinal unit for like two and a half months, not one per not one visitor. You know, and you, you wonder why they're the people who are lying in bed just taking all the tramadol in the morning and trying to forget about life. They've got nothing to get better for. No. I had so much to get better for. And so many amazing friends. But yeah, it's a good point. Some people do disappear and some people who you really don't expect to like come come to the forefront. Did, did it make you reflect on as well the kind of person you were pre-injury? Because I, I think, you know, to have that many people turn up is a nice thing. I reckon well, it's funny actually, it's like living your funeral. Yes. Because you'd like yes. to think, you'd like to think that people would turn up and people would yeah. be sad. It's like you want people to cry because yeah. they're gonna miss you. Yeah. And I lived my funeral, but I get to watch it. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. yeah. Watch and funeral I interactive. Just, it, it was yeah, it was very humbling actually. Like it really humbling. Well, I reckon my and, mum, and, my mum, my dad, and and Chloe may may or may not turn up. Yeah. But but the well, dog that, might turn but up. That's what I thought. Yeah. But like actually and and that's been a big part of the perspective piece for me is feeling very lucky to have the relationships I have and putting a lot more importance on them, not taking that for granted because 
everything had been taken away from me, but I still had my mates and my family in my room every day and no one could take that away from me. Um, and now, you know, uh, you know, when your mum calls and you're just holding the phone over there for like 30 seconds, <laughs> just don't do that anymore. Even though as much as you want to, yeah, but you realise that that is the most important thing in your life. Because your you're not sure you were going to be able to speak to you know, her again or you know, yeah. be able to see her. And, and I think it was after two weeks or something, I'd had a hundred different visitors. People had flown in from like different parts of the world. And I don't think I know a hundred people who I like didn't me. think I did either. I was like, hang on, who's that? Who's <laughs> jumping Wait, on the bandwagon? What, what do they put on those people who just come around to be around misery? You know, yeah, they call yeah, like, to uh, make themselves feel better. I thought a few of them were doing that. Dark tourists just coming yeah. around going, hello, yeah. is this Mr. Jackson? You're yeah. like, I don't know. Yes, yeah, it's Cousin Ed. <laughs> um, what? We, yeah. So I used to get brought loads of, um, people would come bring gifts, right? Yeah. Food normally. But I couldn't eat. I was like literally through a feeding tube for ages. Can you not whiz it, um, ask to whiz it in the blender and feed it in, or is it not work? Like no, they, oh. they're on strict, like, what you're oh. being input Put like a Mars stuff. bar Yeah, but honestly, as soon as I could eat, as soon as I had the feeding tube out, it was like, I went to town, just delivery was there every day. But I had this big pile, like, hamper full of chocolates and stuff. And funnily enough, the if you talk about rugby mates, the percentage of props was completely disproportionate. Word got out, I had this hamper full of decent chocolate at the end of my bed that I wasn't touching. <laughs> You get boys like T Tails and Si Mac just sit there talking to each other and just eating all the snacks and go, see you later. <laughs> I love that. What about, uh, must be a large amount of porn mags brought or is that a sensitive subject? No, because that? that's, that'd be the most, that'd be torture, wouldn't really? it? Really? I, 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 even... I wonder, is it, does it not, do you, do you get involuntary erections and shit like that? You not? do get involuntary erections. Can't really do anything about them with any grip strength. And also it's, it's hard. I've got limited sensation. So I've got brown Saccard syndrome now, which means... One side of me moves poorly but has good sensation. The other side moves well but has poor sensation. Obviously, that wasn't the case at the time. I didn't really have much at all. But it means my sensor, sensory nerves are cut right down the middle of me. Even like it actually runs down the middle of your penis. Johnson. Yeah, well. Johnson, right. Yeah. Um, and literally clean down the middle. But it means that's le the sensation's limited. So it's a lot harder to orgasm, basically. Right. So Lois so is happy, but you're very not so fresh. happy. Yeah, well, yeah, like happy or unhappy. Uh, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. yeah. Used to take five seconds. Now it takes a bit longer. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose yeah. After about fifteen minutes, it's like fucking hell, yeah. roll off. But, yeah. But I mean, oh, that's what I wondered. So I mean, again, I I want to, you know, we're sort of running out of time. But I want to know, is that one of the things? The first things that sort of comes into your head with the sex stuff and going, you know, how do you know what am I going to be able to do here? Yeah. I mean, naturally, as a bloke, probably yeah. is, and that's the kind of thing you don't want to talk to worry other people no. about. So it's good to have peer support on stuff like that. Um, the bladder bowel function like you speak to most people in wheelchairs like they would rather still be in a wheelchair but have normal bladder and bowel function than be walking with poor bladder and bowel function right, okay. it affects you every day you, you get used to the movement thing like your body and brain adapts but it's admin you know the admin of spasms bladder function sexual you know yeah. all of those sorts of things and they're the stuff that can affect your relationships as well yeah um, do they give advice on the sex stuff yeah, to they relationships? Do. yeah they do in hospital they're pretty good but the best advice I've ever had is off other yeah, Fine. people have been through it um, and I'm lucky like I can do it Fine. you know now and again but also my fertility is way down so me and Lois are going through the process now oh really it affects your spinal spinal cord injuries affect your fertility massively so we're trying to work out if we can have kids or how we can have kids and and lots of, you know you so think, many layers to the emo like you, know, you said about the stuff again with Lois you know like why what she's doing is so valuable because there's so many tears like we keep talking about stuff and there's another tear of something I hadn't thought about yeah. you know I thought about the simple things can you walk can you shit yourself can you get hard on but you don't think about the fertility stuff you don't think about the sensitivity you don't think I mean where, where are you, I mean where are you at the moment? So 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 you got to the point where because we don't need to go through every step of your rehab, but you're obviously up and walking and and uh, doing these mad challenges. And you, but you've got the syndrome where you one side sensitive moves better, the other side yeah. doesn't move better, it's unsensitive. What what else is going? So on? my I'm quadriplegic technically. I'm a walking quadriplegic, which means four limbs are affected. When people hear the term quadriplegic, they just assume someone who's you know in a wheelchair can't move yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah. But that's not true. It just means someone's got four limbs affected, which is effectively from a neck break. So if you right. neck break, you're quadriplegic. If you're back break, you're paraplegic. Right. I didn't um, know that, okay. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a, yeah. So I'm a walking quadriplegic with Brown Saccard syndrome. Brown Saccard syndrome only affects about one percent of spinal cord injuries. It's normally from gunshot or stab wounds. But it's where your spinal cord's been cut cleanly and in, in like one half of it's been cut. So that was the shard of disc that cut through half of it. Right. And 
the sensory nerves and the the motor nerves, sensory nerves run out the opposite side of your head. So the right stuff on my right runs out the left and the motor nerves, they stay on the same side. So because I cut the left-hand side of my spinal cord, I cut the motor nerves to my left, but the sensory nerves to my right. So it's all very confusing. And right. that's the thing with neurological injuries, like they're not boring. Like I say, like, <laughs> there's, yeah, there's yeah. so much going You're gonna on. you do it, do it properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do something that's interesting. But um, it affects everything, you know, It's because it's because it's your neurology, your heart rate, blood pressure, you know, I don't sweat from below the chest anymore, so I overheat really easily, can't move properly, don't, I don't have any power in my, any dorsiflexion on the left side, so I wear a foot splint this side, I have to walk with poles unless I'm on level hard surfaces, um, joints taking a battering, like the, that, I mean, you know this better than yeah. anyone, but I, it was my seventh operation, you know, because of rugby. Um, but now on my left side, for example, I've got 70% of the meniscus missing from rugby, but now the, the muscles aren't working properly, so it's just going like this. So you get other aches and pains yeah. as well. Um, and then obviously on top of that, all the stuff we've talked about, bladder, bowel, sexual function, you know, it, it, they're the stuff that affects you day to day and, and, is, it, and it's unseen normally for most, for most people. But it's all manageable for me. I'm lucky in a position where I can manage it all myself. I am independent. You know, I'm here sat talking yeah. to you. I don't need someone with me, no. to travel with me, which is which is massive, you know. Um, and it could have been so much worse. And that's the main thing. I always remember when something fucks up and, you know, I have an accident or you just got to think, mate, to even be in a position where you can have an embarrassing accident is lucky. What? What's your goal now? Like, what's next? Like, how much more improvement are you going to make? And what what do you now? You've made this mad progress, which you didn't even know, and you took it one step at a time. And I imagine everything was a bonus. What do you do now? Like, where do you set yourself now? Because you know, obviously, we're talking a little bit about the, the book. You know, these challenges that you you do is it to do as much mad shit as you can? Um, because you also you're putting your body through turmoil. Like, yeah. I remember you climbed that was the height of Everest, going up and down your stairs. I DJed for part of it, yeah, and by the end of the, the, the however long it took you to do it, there was blood all up the side of one wall because you dragged your knuckles up the side and wrecked yourself. I mean, you're not making life particularly easy for yourself <laughs> while you are helping people and inspiring and raising amazing amounts of money for charity. You're still being a mad bastard. Yeah, but, you know, life shouldn't be easy. Like, a rewarding life isn't an easy one. Like, you should always challenge yourself and put yourself in situations that aren't dangerous, but... You've got to explore what you're capable of, you know, and I think this is, if anything, this has taught me it's I'm way more capable than I thought it was in different areas. I could push myself further. I could, you know, you think as a rugby player, you know, you've, you've won fitness tests, you've put yourself in the bin, like you've, you know, you've smashed it. But actually when you're back against the wall, you realize you weren't even close, you know, to, to how deep you can dig. Um, and I like exploring that and taking on challenges. I don't know if they're going to be possible or not. And the knock on effects of being able to inspire other people from it raise money for our charity or the charities that have supported me. It just seems like a win, win, win all over. Um, yes, my body is getting knackered. I have to understand my body's constantly changing. So I'm constantly having to adapt to it. And I'm learning every day about how to manage it better. Before I'd go and train in the mountains for a mountain. Now I can't do that because I just wrap my joints. So it's all off feet. It's in the gym. But I like that sort of scientific approach to training. I know you'd appreciate that because mm. it's, it's interesting and like and now there's serious curveballs and you've got to you've got to think outside the box a lot of the time like a lot of the issues i face up in the mountains like as soon as it gets below a certain temperature my hands just stop working completely you know and then you've got things like the bladder issues catheter bags freezing you know i'm an ambassador for burkhouse now and they've been amazing in helping me adapt kid to move on and i've got to that point now where if i'm going to achieve these challenges i can't just go and slog it out like i did before and just rely on my resilience now i've got to get everything technically right and i'm enjoying that process again it's like being professional sportsman mm. again what i mean is there terms of uh sorry i'll rephrase that is there uh more therapy and stuff you can do is there, is there like stem cell stuff are you looking to all that kind of thing is there any new age stuff you found that's made a big difference yeah i looked into stem cell back when I was in hospital and, and actually applied for it but I was too I was recovering at a rate where they weren't prepared to go in with stem cells so with stem cells they'd rather do it for people who have plateaued and stopped and I've carried on pushing like four and a half years down the line they say you've only got a year to really get recovery back but I'm still seeing changes now and I speak to people who are pushing 12-15 years down the line who are still oh, seeing wow. still seeing changes so I'll always do that the one hope on the on that side is um, there are some big adva advancements, especially in like neurotech. So uh, Elon Musk got a 
um, company called Neurolink, who effectively replace with a chip in the brain can replace the damaged neurological signals with electrical signals. And he's made the claim that within the next five years, he makes some absurd claims, but he follows through with a lot of them. Mm. For the next five years, he can get he'll get someone who's fully disabled, not just back to normal function, but better than normal function by programming them with a chip in their brain. Now you can only do that if your spinal cord's still attached. And actually, spinal cords very rarely break or cut because they're like a bit of rubber. But when you hear of a complete injury like Hambo or Henry, it's because what's happened is the, the segment of the spinal cord has been under so much pressure from swelling or whatever for so long that the whole cross-section dies. But, it, those, the, but physically, they're still connected. Right. So they're, repla- they're going to replace those impulses because the wiring's still there with electrical impulses. And I'd be surprised in my lifetime if uh, there wouldn't be a medical procedure that could pretty much put me back to normal. And it's just about keeping my body and my mind in a position yeah. where I can benefit from that most. And Imagine you were like it. a super soldier that they put you in and you were like <laughs> leaping over buildings and stuff. Maybe that's the plot for the next book. Yeah, yeah. I quite like that. Maybe they can do it for me. I don't think you can grow an ankle <laughs> joint back though, unfortunately. Um, just talk to us quick about, about Lucky. So, so if, you know, it's out now. Here's the book. Um, where, where can people get it? Well, any normal bookstore or Amazon's probably the, the go-to. Is it a disabled it? bookstore? The, they the, the, no, it's not just in a disabled <laughs> well, bookstore, yeah. Fine, yeah. Fine. And, but uh, I was supposed to record the audio book last week, but it was, I was in um, stuck in Iceland, so I'm right. doing that next week, so that'll be out soon as well. And what can people expect to get from it? We've touched a little bit on, on it. Well, you know, it's, it's just a very honest account. You know, I spoke about how I was probably hi- keeping stuff back from my parents and not want to get them emotionally involved, and I'd kept a blog throughout hospital, and effectively that's why I was approached to write a book. And for quite a long time, I said, no, I was like, I can't write a book. And or not just that, no one's going to want to read it. But eventually, you know, they made the point clear that, you know, this could help more people and you can write, you've done it with your blog. So persuaded me to go for it. But effectively, it's, and but now what I've done when I was writing the blog, I knew my mum and my wife were reading it every day. So I was keeping a lot back. That's just a raw, honest account oh. of everything I went through. But also with the lessons I've learned that I now use in my use day to day to have improved my life and put myself in the headspace of I am today um, weaved through it so it's kind of part memoir part um, personal development but not in like a pushy way it's subtle so hopefully people it's not just for people who are going through tough times themselves hopefully it will help people like that it's for anyone who wants to try and kick on learn some new things about themselves you know different practices and techniques to improve your mind make yourself more resilient all of those sorts of things are you proud of what you've achieved now? Yeah, but I still pinch yourself. I'm just, it's so, like, it's still just a blur, to be honest, mate. Like, I, I'm doing all this stuff. I've got off to the Paralympics and, like, there's a fucking book sound for it. Like, how did that happen? You know, it's just one thing after the other, but I'm just rolling with the punches and I'm, I'm really enjoying everything I'm doing. And I just feel so fortunate to be in the position I am and, and to be in a position where I can do any of it in the first place. I was going to ask you a question, and it's quite crass, and I imagine you get it asked all the time. Would you change what's happened to you now? Because some, I imagine some people go, "Fuck yeah, I would, yeah, I, yeah. I wouldn't want this." Or now, in reflection with all the mindfulness you've had, would do you think this has been the making of you, or has it been a making of a version of you? But you, uh, that you maybe learnt more about yourself that you, that if you had been fully able-bodied, you wouldn't have known. Yeah, I think it's uncovered me, you know. Like, and I think that a lot of us are putting layers on ourselves and restricting ourselves, and everyone's more capable than they think they are, and with just a bit of motivation and, and belief. They can do more. And I think that this is what this has done. The accident has removed, has knocked me back to square one and has made me find out who I really am. It hasn't turned me into a different person. I think it's just uncovered who I was in the first place. And I am grateful for what's happened now. I am grateful for the things it's made me realize and the different perspective it's put on my life and um, the purpose I found and the different things that I do and put me in a position where I can actually help other people like such a privileged position that I was never in before but having said that if I could go back and still have all those mental processes but not piss myself every day or like <laughs> you know or have a fully functioning arsehole would be yeah, quite nice yes, yes. but you know well, I'm did, a fully functioning yeah, arsehole yeah. actually you are yeah, a yeah. fully functioning arsehole I mean. yeah, yeah. so I haven't um, got one I am one yeah um I would obviously would. It's not easy living life with a spinal cord injury. No. And it, what is scary is getting older one. You know, your body's, my body's fucking degrading fast. But the mental side of things, if they came as a package, I would rather be in the position I am now than I was before. 
I want to just finish with one kind of question. If someone's watching this, listening to this, ha- has gone through this or is with someone, what, what one piece of advice would you give them to take forward? Um, communicate is the first step. Like, be honest with yourself um, and then be honest with the people around you. And if you don't want to do that with people you're worried about upsetting, there are people there to, to, to speak to. Whatever your injury, illness, psychological issue, there are other people going through it. It's not just you. It felt like I was the only person going through it. You see it on TV, you hear, hear of Hambo and stuff, but in that moment, you feel like it's just you. But it's not. There's loads of people and there's loads of people that want to help, so it's just about reaching out. We, I talked to... Um very interesting guy called Paul Moore who does a lot of stuff on mental health and he said I asked him what the most common thing was and people say listen you just wouldn't understand it's different for me that's what people say you wouldn't understand it's different for me and however sad it is and however unique the situation is unique the situation is there are so many people that have gone through you and I think it's a very good point to realise actually reaching out and that however scared you are and however fearful you are Look at your journey. If you hadn't done that and you bottled it up and you made the wrong decision, now yeah. you've you you know you'll change lives. I mean, what what's next for you? What's next for 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 Ed Jackson? What mad adventure you've got next? Like, actually, so immediately I've got um, the Paralympics. I'm going to Japan on the 16th of August, which I cannot wait for. The best like, country in the world. Be, but totally the thing is, I'm not I'm not going to be able to experience it properly. I've no. always wanted to go to Japan. I know you don't know yeah. Japan very well, but. Um, it, they're very rigid about where we can go and what we can do because of COVID. But still, just being involved with the Paralympics, something that I've looked up to with admiration since the London Games when sort of Channel 4 took it on and just blew it up and just put shone a light on disability, you know, what it means to be disabled and also how capable people are. And I was sort of enamoured by it before my disability. So now to actually play a part in what is a seriously sort of historic piece of broadcasting is um, is an amazing opportunity and to, to do something well outside of my comfort zone, which is, it already is, you know, you work in media, but if you're doing rugby, you kind of can fall back yeah. on. Now I'm working on all these different countries, all these different pronunciations and within each sport, there's 12 levels of disability. Yes. If I get someone's dis- dis- disability wrong, you know, that's not going to go down very well. So it's like doing a Not thing. in 2021, so anyway. Not in 2021. So I can't wait for that. And then when I get back, I'm going to try and become the first quadriplegic to climb um, Mont Blanc. So I'm doing that in September. <laughs> oh yeah, doing that with um, Leo Holding. He's one of the best climbers in the world and Berghaus are helping me with some kit. So. But do you know what? After that, I don't actually know. Obviously, pushing on with the charity. I don't know where I'm going to be in one year's time, two years' time, five years' time. That used to scare the shit out of me. You know, like, what am I going to do after rugby? Like, what am I going to do next? You've, I'm sure you've been through it before. Yeah. Now I'm excited that I don't know what I'm going to be doing in two years' time, five years' time, where I'm going to be. Um, but because I just, and I've decided, to, I took that decision because it was so out of my hands to just fall back on my values, try and stick to things like your, I don't know, your honesty, your relationships, your work ethic, and just say yes to things. Follow your gut rather than your head. And see what happens, and all this fucking crazy shits going on. So I'm quite enjoying it. Have you ever thought about doing the Paralympics yourself, taking part? Do you know what's funny? Like I, when I was in hospital, it took about four weeks before I had British cycling, British swimming. Shut British, up. Yeah, yeah, because they're like, oh, injured sportsman. He's at a high level neck break. They're thinking medals. Yeah, you know what happened. And I was tempted. Yeah, like it would be an amazing thing to be involved with the with in one of those programs and to go to a Paralympics. But I think because I'd just finished a ten year professional sports career. I was like, not yet. And I know what I'm like. I'd commit to it and then I'd be three years of your life gone. And I'm glad I didn't because right. of what I've done in between. But I'm not writing it off. Fine. Might be something further down the line. And if people want to follow your journey, follow the stuff of the charity, where can they find you? Um, so all my handles are at Ed Jackson 8 across social, all the social media platforms. Um, Millimeters to Mountains is the name of the charity. So Millimeters to Mountains.org or at Millimeters to Mountains. Book's called Lucky. Um, or you can find me in a village just south of Bath if you really want to get stalkerish. <laughs> and some of my listeners do want to get stalkerish. Ed, listen, mate, you're fantastic. Um, I think your positivity, your energy, your your different perspective is incredible. What you've achieved is amazing. Uh, I could not admire people like yourself and Matt Hampson more uh, because I know, like you said about uncovering people, but sometimes at night when you're alone with your thoughts, you you know you. I know what you're really like and I think you can put pretense on and to be as brave as you have been um, you're inspirational um, you're the only person I know that <laughs> three drinks actually makes them walk better which I think is amazing <laughs> five drinks and it's then you're going down point, yeah, yeah. it's your tipping point but thank you so much guys make sure you pick up a copy of, of Lucky um, I'm Chase Haskell you'll be listening to What a Flanker with Ed Jackson this is the last of series two I will catch you 
very soon.